and you may want to do this in uh, presenter mode. And that is in the upper right hand corner where it says view. So good morning, everybody. Uh, we are really, really excited to be hosting this morning, uh, the member meeting. I'm Carol Abrahamson, Executive Director at Mississippi Valley Conservancy. And today we are going to talk about a place for everyone. So welcome and thank you for Zooming in once again this year. We sure did not want to do this by Zoom, but we felt uh, when the decision had to be made, it was the best one to make. Next year, we need to be together. So today is our big day, but really it's your big day your 25th anniversary. And it's your anniversary because it's your organization. We, the staff, are here to carry out the work that you support. So thank you for that support. Whether it's been 25 years or one year, you are the driving force for saving the Driftless for him. This morning, I do want to reflect on what we've done together. Where do we go from here? And why do we do what we do? So over the last 25 years, together, we've connected people to the dreams of protecting their land, connected communities with places in nature to play and learn, and established habitat corridors for biodiversity, all with the common goals of protecting land for abundant wildlife, clean water, fresh food, scenic beauty, local economies, and healthy communities. I'm having trouble getting my slides to change. There we go. Our core mission all along has been to protect and restore native habitats that provide places for wildlife to live and raise their young and to thrive. Now today we have an even greater sense of urgency to protect and restore the land that will be resilient to our changing climate. Protecting clean water is essential to everyone. We prioritize land protection and we encourage sustainable farming practices near waterways to protect the cold streams for fish and wildlife and the wetlands that store the carbon and help prevent more flooding. Yeah. <clears throat> As a generation yeah. of farmers nears retirement, protecting farmland from subdivision has become very, very important to ensure the future of fresh food for your families and for our communities. The breathtaking beauty of the Driftless area is one of our greatest assets. I think you would all agree that it inspires us in many different ways each and every day. Natural beauty, cultural heritage, and recreational opportunities are key strengths of our local economies. And they are closely linked to the land and the water that we protect and we share together. The 24 nature preserves that we've protected offer year round public access to all the benefits of spending time in nature and everyone is welcome to enjoy them. A plan to lead us forward. 25 years ago, a handful of you planted a seed since then, that seed has been nourished and nurtured by countless volunteers and supporters. We now have a strong tree with branches full of professional staff, a dedicated and knowledgeable board of directors, and partners that we can count on, along with sustaining support. All of this top growth is supported by a strong foundation of roots that extend beyond any vision our founders had for protecting the bluffs. Our land protection efforts are prioritized by a strong strategic plan, a plan that includes a climate resilience strategy to protect biodiversity by increasing our habitat corridors. So right now I'd like to take a minute to just recognize our founding members, the people who had the vision over 25 years ago, 
a few of them are pictured here, but I want to thank all of them. Thank you to Gretchen Benjamin, Barbara Frank, Beth Moore, Maureen Kinney, Ann Korshkin, Chuck Lee, Fred Lesher, Dave and Gretchen Skolada, Craig and Mary Thompson, Pat Wilson, and Peg Zappin. They had a vision and they acted on it. They overcame many obstacles with persistence and a lot of hard work. We owe them much more than the recognition that I can offer today. Thank you founders for never giving up and for continuing to support and work tirelessly today to save the Driftless for them. We do what we do because a healthy world requires safe places to play outdoors, discover the wonders of nature, Enjoy a stress-free environment. Recharge your batteries. Enjoy what we all share, Wisconsin's Driftless Area. I thank each and every one of you for all that you have done and continue to do to save the Driftless for them. And now I'm going to introduce Abby Church, our conservation director. Many of you know and love Abby. She is the driving force behind our land protection work. Uh, and she is going to be sharing with you some work of the past year along with our big announcement. Go ahead, Abby. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us all this morning. You are all personally responsible for the 22,318 acres that Mississippi Valley has, Conservancy has protected in our 25 year history. On the map to the right on our service area, the blue stars represent our public nature preserves that are available for environmental education and outdoor nature-based recreation. And those total just over 5,300 acres. The yellow stars represent the 17,000 plus acres of private lands that we have protected through conservation easements. For those of you who joined us last year for our member meeting, since that day to today, we have 657 acres of new projects, which I am going to share with you today. We have a nice mix of easements, amendments, and acquisitions. A big thank you to David and Susan Wygant for working with us to protect their 180 acre conservation easement, their working farmland in Richland County. This site is a mix of forest and farmland. They have spent countless hours improving the forest, species composition, diversity, and functionality, and hosted our Women Caring for the Land workshop last spring. They've turned around these farmlands, addressing erosion and soil loss from conventional um, crop production and converting it all to managed rotationally grazed pasture land with perennial cover. Every year they are greeted by an abundance of bobolinks and Eastern meadowlarks nesting on the property. This site also contributes to water quality. They have seeps and springs and a tributary to Little Fancy Creek, which is part of the Upper Pine River watershed. You all know that when you protect perennial cover and vegetation around water resources, you're not just protecting the 180 acres of the property itself, but those lands all the way down the watershed. So speaking of headwaters, we have another site up north in Monroe County that has seeps, springs, and a feeder creek to Big Creek, a class one trout stream and part of the Little Lacrosse River watershed. Thank you to Pete and Ginny Quirin for protecting their land with us. This was a unique transaction in that they bought an 88 acre property that was already subject to a conservation easement and elected to add, to amend that easement to add 22 acres of adjacent habitat. 
You all know that reforestation and tree planting is a key role in addressing climate change as those trees pull that carbon from the atmosphere to sequester it into the soil. Pete Quirin has single-handedly planted hundreds of trees on this property. You can see here some of his white pine. He's also planted white oak, hickory, black cherry, and other species, much to the appreciation of aerial wildlife. In addition to easements and amendments, we also have some acquisitions to share with you today. Thank you to Fran Kaplan for working with us. We were able to acquire a 44 acre Bluffland property here in La Crosse County. You can see here in the foreground, in addition to the role of trees in sequestering carbon, prairie vegetation provides an equally important role. We have big blue stems, side oats grama, Indian grass, prairie drop seed, and other prairie plants that have root systems they can't see us. that extend from five to 15 feet down below the soil to hold these steep slopes in place. The incredible prairie diverse diversity also supports our area pollinators. This acquisition joins other lands protected by Mississippi Valley Conservancy for a grand total of 1,200 acres of contiguous protected habitat. And you'll hear some themes today of contiguous corridors and water quality um, and other conservation benefits. This acquisition was made possible by support from all of you, support from the Wisconsin Knowles Nelson Stewardship Program, and also from the Paul E. Stry Foundation. Thank you to Elmwood Partners Limited Partnership, a partnership which is made up of Paul Gleason, Kevin Fry, and Dan Gillette. They donated a 50-acre Bluffland property in the city of Onalaska in La Crosse County. This is a site that meets multiple priorities. It's within the Mississippi Valley Conservancy's Mississippi River Priority Area. It's within the Onalaska Greenway Boundary. It meets the goals of the Onalaska Natural Lands Protection Program. And this site is one that joins our French Valley Nature Preserve, again, expanding a corridor of protected habitat. And we all know that one of the key pieces of the Conservancy's mission to protect land by preventing residential development ensures that those habitats and species remain resilient to climate change. Thank you to John and Rita Hoffman who are with us this morning for their conservation easement on 60 acres in Richland County. Once again, a site with springs, seeps, a quarter mile of a creek that feeds the Kickapoo River that is now permanently protected. Check out this diversity. They converted farmland that located along the creek to native prairie vegetation. This is a clear win for pollinators. We all know and have seen in the news that pollinators are struggling and at sites like these, that provide native diverse wildflowers, ensure that our pollinators, especially those that migrate, can come back year after year and find not only a nectar and pollen source, but also the host plants for things like monarch butterflies can find the milkweed that they need for their caterpillars. A healthy population of caterpillars supports a healthy population of birds and the food web continues. Uh, they have spent countless hours improving and managing their property and we are Really excited to see it permanently protected. Thank you to Karen Hansen for her 261 acre farm that is now permanently protected with a conservation easement in Trempolo County. This organic farmland provides a dual role, which Nicole will be talking more about today, in addressing climate change by producing food products and simultaneously providing natural solutions to climate change. This is a site that includes all of the features that we look for. Springs, seeps, creeks, uh, is part of the Middle Trempolo River watershed, organic pasture land, organic cropland, prairie, cliffs, forests, and something else that you haven't heard much about today. This site also protects archeological features. She has archeological resources that date back 10,000 years before present and is currently working with a local archeologist to pursue national designation for those archeological resources. So another site that we are really excited is permanently protected. Thank you to Jim and Millie Lindell and Douglas Sherman for working with us down in Grant County. We added 40 acres to Devil's Backbone State Natural Area. 
This expands the site to 165 acres total. And again, contributes to our corridors of protected habitat. What you can see in the background is 240,000 acre U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Upper Mississippi National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. This 40 acre property protects one of the rarest natural communities in our area, Algific Talus Slope, and also protects those sinkholes that provide the air intake that makes for a functional Algific natural community. The site has federally threatened northern monkshood, state threatened cherry stone drop snails, and numerous other rare species on the property. And on the water quality side, the site has forested seeps, waterfalls, a creek that pours into Chase Creek, which was just featured a few weeks back, and the Driftless Area Symposium for its notable population of naturally reproducing brook trout. So another exciting acquisition. Thank you to all of you for making this work possible. There are three things that make our conservation mission a success. First and foremost, the incredible generosity of those landowners who choose to work with us. All of the work we do is voluntary and it's up to willing landowners to ensure that have a shared land ethic with us to ensure that lands are protected. The second thing is all of you and your support. If Mississippi Valley Conservancy is a machine that achieves conservation, you are the fuel that makes it go. The third thing in that machine is the cogs and wheels, <laughs> the skills and expertise provided by our team, which is made up of Nancy Larson, our financial finance and operations manager, Sarah Bratnover, our communications director, Levi Plath, our land manager, Kristen Zumo, our conservation associate, Chris Kirkpatrick, our conservation specialist, Sienna Muehlfeld, restoration coordinator, Leanne Cruz, development coordinator, and Connor Cody, our stewardship coordinator, who have all put countless hours in pulling the pieces together to make these complex transactions come together. And now, speaking of complex transactions, a sneak peek into an upcoming project. You have heard a trend today, the importance of protecting water quality, biodiversity, habitat, and large blocks of protected habitats, contiguous corridor of protected habitats. We have an exciting new project in the works. This site falls within the Nature Conservancy's resilient and connected network model as a site of high recognized landscape biodiversity, high climate resilience, high local connectedness. It joins over 1900 acres of protected lands, which includes both a DNR owned state natural area and a DNR wildlife area for a total block of habitat of over 3,500 acres. This site has a lot of the features we've talked about today. It has a class one trout stream, wetlands, woodlands, prairies and cliffs, sedge meadows, rare species, especially birds. This is a very significant site for forest interior nesting birds, which Craig Thompson will tell you more about here in a minute. And this site will be known as the Plum Creek Conservation Area. This site is 1,610 acres and will be the largest acquisition in Mississippi Valley Conservancy's 25 year history. The site is in Crawford County. It includes working farmland and pasture land. And we will be embarking on a long-term vision and strategy for the restoration of this site to increase the native diversity and functionality of those natural communities. This will, planning effort will be done in conjunction with the Savannah Institute and the Nature Conservancy. This acquisition was made possible by significant support from an anonymous donor support from the Nature Conservancy, and we'll hear from Elizabeth here in a moment, and support from the Paul E. Stry Foundation and the John C. Bach Foundation. So with that, I would like to introduce you all to Craig Thompson. Craig has the honor of having the longest title of anyone on this Zoom today. Craig is the Chief of Program Integration at the Bureau of Natural Heritage Conservation of the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. For the past 30 years, he has held various positions with DNR, specializing in migratory bird conservation and landscape scale protection efforts. Craig holds adjunct faculty appointments in the biology departments of the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse 
and Viterbo University and provides technical support for conservation initiatives in Costa Rica and Peru. Craig was a founding member of Mississippi Valley Conservancy where he continues to serve as board member emeritus. And I'll turn it over to you, Craig. Thanks, Abby, and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here this morning. The, the story that Abby set up, this is the story of a property that was originally known as Kickapoo Canyon, and it's nothing short of an amazing conservation saga that has literally played out over decades. It began back in 1968, before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, when in recognition of the property's significance, the Department of Natural Resources, hereafter known as the department, purchased public access easements from the Lewis family that covered most of the property. It didn't really ensure its protection, but it did provide the opportunity for hunters and anglers to access the property for recreational pursuits. Then in 1975, as the Vietnam War was ending, we purchased the eastern half of the property, creating what we now call the Wazika unit of the Kickapoo Wildlife Area. And as Abby had alluded to, that property is exceedingly rich bird-wise. In fact, it has one of the highest breeding bird species diversity counts in all of Southern Wisconsin, including many considered to be high conservation priorities, not only in Wisconsin, but across North America. It's vitally important. From the 1980s, the decade of Ronald Reagan and the fall of the Berlin Wall until 2015, when millennials actually outnumbered boomers, go figure, the department had made numerous attempts to acquire the western half of the property, all unsuccessful for a variety of reasons. And then in January of 2020, just a little over two years ago, Kurt Schlimme, a talented biologist with the Nature Conservancy, contacted the department to let us know Kickapoo Canyon was in fact for sale. That contact sparked a flurry of discussions with TNC, MVC, and DNR. There was little doubt that the property was vitally important, but securing it, but secure, excuse me, securing the funding to actually make that happen was the ultimate challenge. And as a result of that, our efforts began to stall. Even more worrisome, as we stalled, we learned that an offer to purchase the property had been made. And thankfully, the Lewis family declined that offer. Needless to say, the pressure was on, but literally things were hanging by a thread. And then in what can only be considered a fairy tale ending, an anonymous donor with great foresight, a deep unwavering commitment to conservation, and the most profoundly generous spirit I have ever witnessed offered to acquire the property so it could be permanently protected. That single action, that single action united both halves of the property that had been cleaved for decades and concluded more than 50 years of effort to secure a future for what was then called Kickapoo Canyon. What a fitting capstone for 25 years of progressive conservation action by the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. The Plum Creek Conservation Area, as it's known now, literally heralds a new era of conservation for our beloved Douglas area. Congratulations to everyone involved for a truly remarkable collaborative conservation effort. And happy anniversary, MVC. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Next up, we have Elizabeth Taylor, State Director of the Nature Conservancy in Wisconsin. Elizabeth leads a team of professional and volunteer conservation scientists, practitioners, fundraisers, policy experts and advocates working to protect land and water through targeted action and productive partnerships. Working closely with colleagues, volunteer leaders and donors, Elizabeth has helped raise more than $90 million for conservation priorities in Wisconsin and around the world. She participated in the teams that protected St. Martin Island in Lake Michigan and launched, launched an initiative for Sheboygan River water quality through farmer collaboration. She partners with the Wisconsin Board of Trustees to shape and implement multi-year conservation plans to build strength through diversity across every level of their organization. Elizabeth co-led the effort to create a new three-year strategic plan for 2020 to 2023 
for the Nature Conservancy in Wisconsin that guides the chapter's efforts to partner with others in tackling the most urgent conservation challenges facing people and nature. And with that, here is Elizabeth Kaler. Thank you, Abby, and congratulations to you and to every single person on this call. I am feeling goosebumps from everything that you all have shared this morning, and we did it. Um, so feel that for a moment, everybody on the call, and I'll share with you that when a few of us first heard about this place um, and this opportunity, I'll confess that at the Nature Conservancy, we did have a discussion or two that it's just too big. We can't do it. But really, it was just that we can't do it alone. And each of us here this morning can understand that because we're all engaged in something much bigger than ourselves because we care about nature and wildlife and those birds out there and clean water and the future of our home base in the Driftless region. We come together and we create organizations just like Carol was talking about at the beginning. We make these organizations to do more than any one of us could do alone. And then because our challenges and our opportunities today are so big and so complex, our organizations, the organizations that we create have to partner to achieve something like this, like what we're celebrating today. And those partnerships need to be built on shared goals and humility and trust. And they're, only, they're really the only way that we could protect the Plum Creek Conservation Area. And they're the only way that will safeguard the health of Wisconsin's driftless area. So because we've been able to do this, it's just another reason to have hope and optimism for our future. And the other great thing about partnerships is that they're also fun and fulfilling. And it's been such a treat for me, I'm based here in Madison, to get to hear from my colleagues working out there um, about their visits to the property and how much they've enjoyed working with everyone involved in this success. So thank you all, every one of you for your role and this partnership of partnerships. And again, just take a moment to really feel we did it. And congratulations to all of us. Thank you, Elizabeth. And in addition to the role of partnerships, our volunteers also play a really key role. I'd like to introduce Sue Dillenbeck, board president of Mississippi Valley Conservancy. She's been our president since 2020. Prior to that, she was vice president from 2017 to 2020. Sue has supported Conservancy staff with the development of every single project that I share today. She attends the closing, signs the documents, and with that, I will turn it over to Sue Dillenbeck. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Each year we recognize the outstanding volunteers who do so much, both indoors and outdoors, to support our conservation goals. Here are the generous volunteers who stood out for their extraordinary contributions of time and talent in 2021. Our outreach volunteer is Sue Knopf, who is almost an institution at MVC. She served on our educational outreach committee since 2014. With her love of hiking and her years of experience as a graphic designer and editor, she has over the years donated hundreds of hours to developing our nature preserve brochures, hiking maps, and trail trek challenge materials. In 2020, she donated her time and talents to designing new interpretive signage as part of our Love of the Bluffs grant project. Most recently, she developed big, beautiful, and durable interpretive graphic panels for the trailhead kiosks at eight of our most popular nature preserves. All of these have a giant impact on the Conservancy's visibility in the community. Thank you so much, Sue. Our Land Restoration Volunteer of the Year is Alan Beatty. Alan has climbed more than his fair share of bluffs with our land management team over the years and has contributed greatly to the health of the Conservancy Nature Preserves. The list of things Alan has done is enormous. We're always thrilled to have his help. In 2021, he assisted on prescribed burns at Boscobel Bluffs, Angel Bluff, and New Amsterdam grass grasslands, planted hundreds of trees at Cassville Bluffs, lent a hand during the tornado cleanup at Boscobel Bluffs, and helped clear red cedars from the bluff prairies at Sugar Creek Bluff. 
Alan also helped with the launch of, Na of Naturehood Connections this year by passing, distributing flyers, assisting with restoration activities, and supporting staff at training sessions. Over the years, Alan has recruited his son to help landowners pull garlic mustard and allowed us to auction off his mustard busting skills at our fall fundraiser. Thank you for all, all you have done to help with our local habitat restoration, Alan. Our habitat partner of the year is Friends of the Blufflands, which is a small but mighty group that was formed in 2016 in response to the epic task of helping with many management needs of the 1,000 plus acres of Bluffland nature preserves in the La Crosse area. These dedicated volunteers served as a catalyst to bring together resources from state and federal agencies, local municipalities, private contractors, and local volunteers to drastically improve the habitat as a number of local sites, including several permanently protected by Mississippi Valley Conservancy. Friends of the Blufflands provides a voice for the natural habitat and native biodiversity. They implemented oak reforestation efforts at one site, invasive reed canary grass, crown vetch and black locust control at other sites, have controlled invasive brush removal. Expanded, expanded remnant prairies and improved pollinator plantings. Beyond the work they personally implemented though, through quite literally hundreds of hours of work, the Friends also applied for grant funding and hired contractors to extend their conservation impact even farther. Mother Nature rewarded their efforts with the discovery of a population of the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebees in one of their project areas. A big thank you to the Friends of the Blufflands Mississippi Valley Conservancy's Habitat Partner of the Year. Our conservationist of the year, you'll recognize his name because he's been here before, Craig Thompson was among the partners who kept alive a decades long effort to permanently protect the 1600 acre Plum Creek Nature Preserve that we celebrate today. Craig has specialized in migratory bird conservation and protected areas management with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources since he joined the DNR in 1986. He's been at the forefront of habitat protection efforts in Wisconsin, and as such, was one of the founders of the Mississippi Valley Conservancy, now an emeritus board member. He's also worked with international partners by leading fundraising birding tours to help preserve habitat in the Central and South American countries, where many of our migratory birds spend the winter. He presently serves as Chief of Program Integration for the DNR's Natural Heritage Conservation Program. We can't thank all of you enough along with all of our volunteers. And we invite all of you, if you're not already a volunteer with Mississippi Valley Conservancy to share your skills and talents with us. We can always find a spot for you. And it's now my privilege to introduce our guest speaker. Nicole, Nicole Rakovich oversees the Climate Smart Farming Program at Organic Valley, America's largest cooperative of organic farmers and one of the nation's leading organic brands. She leads the co-op's initiatives to continually improve the environmental benefits of the co-op's nearly 2,000 farms in 34 states, focusing on practices that reduce emissions and sequester carbon. Nicole and her husband live in Southwest Wisconsin on an off-grid homestead powered 100% by the wind and the sun. And now, Nicole, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I have a great deal of respect and admiration for the Conservancy. I actually live uh, down the road from a large tract of land that you all manage, so I get to enjoy those benefits. Uh, Today, I will tell you a little bit about our climate work here at Organic Valley. Um, and as you said, I'm the Director of Sustainability. I've been with the cooperative for almost 10 years now. So a little bit about Organic Valley. We are a cooperative of farmers. We have nearly 1,700 small family farms in our membership in 34 different states. We are primarily a dairy cooperative, but we do also market eggs, produce, and beef. Everything we do is organic. So all of our products are certified organic and all of our farmer members are certified organic. This year is our 34th year uh, in business. Um, 
and we were founded and still operate today right here in the Driftless region. Our headquarters is in Vernon County in Lafarge, and then our second office building is in Monroe County in Cashton. So we are proud to be in the Driftless region with you all. Last year, we set a goal, a climate goal, to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. We, and along with that, we set a couple interim targets to keep us on track to get there. The first, first one being a 15% reduction by the year 2030. And I'll just, uh, tell you a little bit about how we set this climate goal. So we worked with a, being a cooperative, we have a close relationship with our farmers who are the owners. So we did have a farmer climate task force that we worked with to review various pieces of data uh, and come up with a, a joint goal together. And some of the pieces of data we did look at are sort of our baseline of where we are today as a business. And so we, our business facilities are powered with 100% renewable electricity. And then at the farm level, we know through a life cycle analysis that our dairy farm emissions are lower than average. A little bit more about our life cycle assessment. So, or an LCA. An LCA can be done on virtually any product. And what it does is evaluate the environmental impacts of that product. So we did conduct an LCA for our, our milk at the farm level. So we looked at all of the impacts of uh, producing organic milk at the farm level from soil to farm gate. And through that work, we have found out that we are um, America's low carbon dairy. And uh, sort of the main factors behind that are, well, number one, that our farmers use organic management practices, such as organic fertilizer. Uh, but then additionally, the majority of our farmers have dry manure management systems. They strive for feed self-sufficiency, meaning they produce the majority of their feed on farm and don't have that transportation to the farm of the feed. Uh, and then also what's unique about our LCA is we were able to look at the carbon sequestration occurring on our dairy farms. And so our our dairy members have about double the pasture acres as required by the organic standards. So there is a significant amount of carbon sequestration occurring on those pastures. So this is where we are today at the farm level, but uh, I did mention we have that climate goal to get all of our emissions down to a net of zero. And so how we're gonna do that is through what's called carbon insetting. So you may know the term carbon offset or carbon credit. And this essentially is the opposite of that. So a carbon offset would be if we were to purchase carbon credits from a project outside of our supply chain, perhaps in another country, um, but instead the route that we've chosen to do is to develop new carbon projects on our member farms and create a system where we'll monitor and verify that carbon over the years and then apply those, those carbon reductions to our own footprint to get us to zero. So essentially we'll be um, developing carbon reduction and carbon removal projects on our member farms and as an incentive to our farmers, uh, paying them a direct 
price per ton of carbon that's either removed or sequestered. On the bottom of the screen are just some co-benefits that come along with, with climate smart farming practices, which of course there's great overlap with everything that's been said this morning um, that the Conservancy focuses on, right? There's water quality benefits, biodiversity, soil health, climate resiliency. Uh, there's also not on the screen farmer well-being benefits, uh, clean air, labor savings, et cetera. So on the next two slides, I just give uh, some examples of what specifically these practices are. So the first category are those practices that reduce emissions or, um, yeah, reduce emissions or greenhouse gases. And they're in three main buckets, energy, manure, and feed management. So the picture on the screen obviously is a, a solar energy array. That's a pretty popular practice with our, our farmers. So we'll be encouraging more of that along with you know, additional energy efficiency practices such as LED lighting, uh, high efficiency ventilation, plate coolers, et cetera. Also in that category is electrification of farm equipment. Uh, the next is manure management. So um, for those remaining farms that don't have a dry manure management system, we'll, we'll work with them to convert to such a system such as composting. And then the last on the screen there is feed management, which really is, um, has to do with the cow's digestion system uh, and enteric methane emissions. So enteric methane are those emissions that are created through the cow's natural digestion process. And there are things that could be do, done to improve the efficiency of that, of that digestion, such as improving feed quality, making tweaks in the ration, but then also you may have heard of, there's different feed supplements that are becoming popular, uh, such as seaweed, but then there's also a different essential oils. And then this slide are practices that we'll be including in our carbon insetting program that sequester or remove carbon. So it could, so this includes carbon that's sequestered into the ground, uh, below ground carbon, but then also above ground in trees or, or other woody biomass. So first on the list are tree planting, such as you know, different agroforestry practices. What's shown on the screen here is civopasture, which is the interplanting of trees and pasture together. Um, this is quickly becoming a practice that's pretty popular with our farmers. Um, the farm that's on the screen here is, is not local to the Driftless. They are in Pennsylvania, but there's a large group of our Pennsylvania farmers where this practice is really starting to uh, gain a lot of traction. So it's exciting to see. Uh, you know, as the trees get bigger, there'll be benefits to the cow by providing shade. And then something that we're really interested to see is how these trees can provide additional feed or, or fodder for the cows themselves. So I think that is pretty exciting. Um, also for tree plantings, uh, we're including windbreaks. So planting of trees along the, the field to protect either the crops or the, the livestock from wind and then riparian buffers, which are trees and shrubs along waterways, of course, to um, pro help protect those waterways as well as sequester carbon. Uh, enhanced grazing is the next on the list. So our farmers already practice managed grazing, but how can we make further improvements 
upon those systems to sequester even more carbon. Uh, things like perhaps adding bio, more biodiversity to the pastures, um, you know, perhaps uh, changes in the rotation itself, itself, maybe the, you let the grasses grow taller and have longer rest times in between. Uh, and then the last on the list is regenerative cropland practices. So in that we're looking at reduced tillage as a main one, as well as compost application and cover cropping. So over uh, the next coming years, we'll be helping our farmers develop hundreds of these projects, um, actually a thousand over the next five years, and that will help us reach our climate goal. And I forgot to say, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, but that is the end of my presentation. Um, so I will stop. Nicole. The, yeah, there is one question in the chat. Okay. How do, you, how do you account for the carbon that is below the first three to four feet of soil? How do you give credit for that? Uh, this person is just learning more um, with the Gabe Brown's writings. Yeah, yep. So that's a good question related to, right, the methodology for measuring and documenting soil carbon. Um, and right now we are not going down that deep with our measurements as we verify the, the carbon in the field over time, uh, we'll only be going uh, a couple feet. But that is a good question because there is, you know, potentially movement of the carbon between the different, uh, profiles in the soil. So I think that is just something we'll learn more about over time and maybe we'll adjust our, our methodology there. Okay. Are there any other questions for Nicole? You can uh, either unmute yourself and go ahead and ask those questions or put them in the chat. Yeah, I have this one question. Um, sorry, I was typing it, but it going too slow. Um, basically, my question is very short for managed grazing. I may have missed it, but um, is this working with um, like NRCS programs to do grazing plans or like a county? So, so we have a sustainability team at Organic Valley, um, which is actually part of a larger farm resources team. So we have internal technical staff that work with our farmers, but because we do have farmers in 34 different states, we do rely on local providers quite often. Uh, and so sometimes that, that, that is through NRCS, helping the farmer to get NRCS funding. Um, and we've also developed a network of grazing planners throughout the US because we've realized that it's one of the needs that we have. Um, yeah, so there's a combination of internal assistance from the co-op and then external working with those, those local service providers. Okay, and Nicole, in the chat, uh, we have a question. You mentioned the role of essential oils. Could you share more, more about that, please? Yeah. So there is an interesting seed supplement um, that we've been watching. It's called Agolin, and it's essential oils from, uh, I believe oregano is the main one. And there's research that has shown that it reduces the methane produced by the rumen of the cow. Um, and it is a certified organic product. So we are interested in uh, doing some on-farm demonstrations to verify that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have read and heard about that as well. It's really interesting to see the research on that. Yeah, uh, the yep. And then I guess maybe just to add to that, um, right, not only is there a a reduction in the methane from the rumen, there's an increase in feed efficiency, which, which means 
right the cow she's using her feed more efficiently and so there'll be some some of those benefits as well to the farmer and then we have a question have you seen neighboring non-organic valley farms being influenced by these great practices on co-op farms and are others trying some of these practices yes i think so um i think in in general, I see a trend in the food industry. Um, there's many food companies that have set climate goals and, you know, therefore are working with their own supply chains, um, you know, to do more for the climate. So I, yeah, so I just see this growing trend of, of a, uh, of an interest in climate smart farming practices and, and farmers, you know, wanting to do more and learning from each other, et cetera. All right. Are there any other questions for Nicole? Okay, well, thank you, Nicole. It was really interesting to learn about how small organic family farms are reversing climate change. It's been a remarkable morning, learning, reflecting on the past and hearing the big announcement about saving Plum Creek Conservation Area and the collaborative work it has taken to make this project come true. Because this is an amazing property um, and you all heard from Craig the importance of it on our migrating birds, we know that it is going to take decades of restoration work uh, on this property along the, the streams in the forests and on the farmland. The Nature Conservancy and a very generous couple have come together to donate $250,000 to create a restoration endowment for this property. Now, in our 25th anniversary year, I am inviting each one of you to help me match that generous gift to grow that endowed fund to $500,000. In the coming weeks, you're going to get a letter that's going to tell you about how you can help. Any and every gift will make a difference. So consider giving $25 for our 25th anniversary, or maybe $250. Or perhaps you have the ability to give $2,500 toward this match. It doesn't matter how much it is. It matters that we all come together as we have for the past 25 years to do amazing work. We only can do this together. We thank you for your help in making protection of the Driftless Area a priority for the past 25 years and know that there's so much more to do, but we are already rolling up our sleeves and moving forward with more land protection, habitat restoration, and opportunities for you to be able to spend time in nature close to home. Our goal in this 25th anniversary year is to protect a total of 25,000 acres. Now, of course, Plum Creek will get us a little closer, uh, but there's plenty of work left to do over the coming months. So thank you all so much for caring. You really are making a difference in whatever way you are helping out, whether you are a volunteer out in the field or in the office, or talking to your friends and neighbors about the work that we do, or a landowner who's donated a conservation easement, or one of our great supporters. Just thank you so much. We cannot do this work alone. And it's all because that you care that we're able to do what we do. Now, I'm going to announce our door prize winners. We have three door prizes and the names that we're drawing. Winner number one is Daryl Wood. Daryl, you are going to be receiving a book titled Birds of the Upper Mississippi River and Driftless Area, generously donated by Big River Magazine. And our second winner is Kevin Strong. You won a set of ceramic coasters that were imprinted with the Monarch Butterfly image. And these were gifted to us by artist and photographer, Tom Rohr. And lastly, Sister Karen Capel, you won a rustic wooden birdhouse that was handmade by a student supporter. And all of the winners will be uh, reached out to by our 
uh, development coordinator, Leanne Cruz, to arrange uh, the pickup of those items. Now we, we have ended a bit early today. Uh, so I'm gonna welcome any of you that have things you need to do, go ahead, um, bid us goodbye and have a wonderful day. But if you care to stay on for a while, I'm happy to have you unmute yourselves and we can do what we can do to visit on the chat or on Zoom um, for the next you know, 15 or 20 minutes if you'd like. But again, feel free to log off if you have other things to move on to. Um, but I'm going to stay on for a while. And if you want to visit, I'm happy to do that with you. Alan, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. We can just have a conversation. We don't have to be formal. Hi, Carol, are, are you yes. hearing? Oh, this, this is Barb Frank. Uh, yes. I just want to compliment you on an excellent presentation. And I'm an artist, so I really get visual images. I'm so impressed with the photography. I don't know who did it. Well, thank you, um, Barbara. And Barbara is one of our founding members. So I really appreciate that. Um, as you know, it takes a team. And so many folks work together uh, to do all the work that we do. And we're currently for our 25th anniversary too, I wanna give a shout out to Vendi Advertising because they have been really helpful and continue to be very helpful. Uh, they did a lot of photography for us, some of which you've seen today. And they are helping us to put together our 25th anniversary conserved magazine, which will be mailed out uh, in early June. So look for that in your um, mailboxes this spring. Those to you all. Thank you. And to you as well. Look at the vision and what you've created. And congratulations to all of our award winners today. I wish we could be together so I could shake your hands and give you hugs hopefully next year. If you have questions for Abby, she's still on. Um, Craig is still on. Sarah, our, our communications director is still on. So feel free to chat or ask questions. I have a question for Nicole. Um, is Organic Valley um, doing anything to incentivize the uh, your vendors like truckers and um, and retailers and packaging plants to lower their footprint? That is a great question, Sarah. Um, not at this moment. We are focusing at the farm level because through our comprehensive greenhouse gas assessment, we know that about 80% of our emissions originate at the farm level. So, well, actually it's 80% um, when we just look at dairy, but it's closer to 90 when we look at, at all, all farm supply. So for the moment, we've our strategy is to focus on the farm level. Um, yeah, but we have for sure thought about it. I guess there's things that we're kind of waiting for it to happen in the industry, right? Like electrification of transportation, um, you know, that's coming pretty close quickly. So yeah, focusing on the farm level for the time being at least. Thanks. Well, Carol, do you want to mention um, that we're going to continue celebrating our anniversary later this summer? Yes, I, I absolutely want to talk about that. So uh, plans are in the works. We are going to have a celebration party uh, for our 25th anniversary. So we'll be rolling that out soon. Um, keep watching. I'm sure we'll have that out in our e-news 
uh, once we get our, our plans in place. But we do want to all get together for real in person this summer and ha have a party and celebrate what these founding members, um, the vision that they created and what has come of that today. Uh, so do look forward to that. We don't have a, a, de a set date and place for uh, to announce to you today, but we are working on that. We have to celebrate. This is a, a big year and uh, a lot of people have done great work to make everything happen. I just want to say congratulations on the new acquisition, um, the Plum Creek or whatever the name of it was. It sounds like a fantastic place. I'm looking forward to getting out and seeing what it looks like. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, yes, and I, I cannot um, tell you enough how important this property is, but the only way it came together was through a solid partnership, um, you know, for the DNR, for the Nature Conservancy, for our anonymous donor, um, the, the foundations who stepped up to help with all of the funding that it took to put this project together. Uh, it's such an important piece and we know it's going to make a huge difference when it comes to climate resilience. Yeah, great, great news. And Melinda, we will be uh, undertaking some inventories of the natural resources of that property over the coming years. So if you've got some free time to volunteer. We would love your expertise. Yeah, okay. Well, let me know when you need me. <laughs> that kind of willingness is what makes this whole organization work. Yeah. I'm gonna lure Craig out there though with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need no luring. I'll just <laughs> we'll pick a day and go. Okay. Question for you, Craig, on that property. If you had to pick one bird species that you think is the most benefited by this acquisition, that this is the most crucial for, which which bird would you pick? Wow, that, that's <laughs> actually not a fair question, Abby. <laughs> So I'm going to respond with two. One, th this is Wisconsin's premier landscape for a, a little blue canopy dweller called the cerulean warbler, which is in very steep decline. It's lost about 70, 75% of its population over the last 40 years. And th this is literally this, the lower Wisconsin Riverway with all of the properties associated with it. And the Riverway itself is literally the stronghold in the upper Midwest for this species. And, it's critically important. And even though this property had been used intensively for agricultural purposes for a number of years, ceruleans were found there in good numbers, surprisingly good numbers. And so it is going to play an even more important role for that rapidly declining species as time goes on. The other one I wanna mention is something that is, that is now really hitting the conservation radar screen in a big way, and that's a a very stealthy, secretive bird called the yellow-billed cuckoo. I don't know how many of you have seen cuckoos, but they're, they're, they're lovely. They're about a foot long. They have a, a tan back and a creamy white breast. And uh, they're great at vocalizations. They can be very hard to track down. That's a bird that winters in the Gran Chaco of Central South America, a landscape that is literally being heavily impacted by conversion to soybean agriculture. And so we're seeing now, we're starting to see rapid declines in that species as well. And once again, the Driftless lights up as being the stronghold for that species in the upper Midwest, particularly in Wisconsin. And Kickapoo Canyon, again, had good numbers of yellow bill cuckoos. That's the same for the Wazika unit of the wildlife area on the east side of the river. And so with those two properties operating in unison as a large conservation unit, oh my gosh, it's just so important. And I think both of those species will benefit significantly as will a host of others. It's gonna be very exciting to track species responses to restoration efforts over time. So um, I'm really excited about it. And something, you know, I wanna to mention to everybody that's still on, if you ever wake up on a spring morning and go, gosh, I really would like to just go to a cool place and listen to bird songs and tune out everything else, the kick, this is the place to do it. It's a very low density environment in terms of people. There are just a few roads in the area. 
There's not a lot of traffic. You can sit out there on the, at, on, at dawn and just hear the most amazing dawn chorus, one of the finest in Wisconsin. And so I think, actually, as I'm thinking, Sarah and Carol and Abby, that would be a great place for that kind of field trip. But let's go listen to the Driftless field trip and uh, just take chairs and sit first thing in the morning. It will be spectacular. It's a just, it is a remarkable place. So there's that a lot of good answer to your question, Abby. <laughs> That's why Craig is conservationist of the year. <laughs> and can I throw another bird question at Craig? Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask specifically about whippoorwills. Um, I, I've learned that they're, they're kind of going downhill, but I've never heard a real good reason why. Like, what about our forests? I mean, is it true they're trending downhill? And what, what can we do with the forest to, to help them hold? Yeah, Todd, it's a great question, and it, whippoorwill is a conundrum. We think there are two things that are really contributing to the precipitous declines for that species. And by the way, I have talked to so many people that when we first, when Mary and I first moved to the Driftless back in 1987, we would hear whippoorwills, and virtually everybody heard them scattered throughout the area. So they were relatively common only uh, 30, 40 some years ago. They've declined significantly since, probably two reasons for that. One, whippoorwills nest on the ground. And as a ground nesting bird, they're very vulnerable to the loss of eggs and young because of raccoons and possums and deer and all those other things that are out there always looking for something to eat. And in addition, whippoorwills are considered, uh, I fall into a group of birds called long distance migrants. And those are birds that winter in Central and South America. And of course, the habitats for the, all of those species that winter in Central and South America are uh -huh. under great duress. And so we're losing, we have habitat impacts on both ends of their hemispheric uh -huh. ranges. Uh -huh. So I think that's what's happening. It, and those are conspiring to drive bird numbers down. So if you have whippoorwills yet, you're very fortunate. And this is a landscape, the Kickapoo Canyon, the Plum Creek Nature, or excuse me, the Plum Creek Conservation Area and the adjacent Wazika Wildlife Area is going to be an important place where we may be able to hang on to whippoorwills if we can intervene in time. I just wanted to add that uh, in order to do what you're suggesting for us to go and listen, Craig, um, we will be sharing information very soon within a, just a few weeks about Ex uh, exactly where this is and um, what you can, you know, how to get there and so forth. That'll all be on our website soon, as soon as our official press release goes out uh, in just a few weeks. So this was terrific. Brief, yeah. I'd, oh. Go ahead, Bob. So, Craig, there's a question. Do you, could you do a podcast on birds? You know so much. Ah, uh, well, um, thank you. I appreciate that that reflection. Uh, I suppose I'd never considered it. Not quite sure how to do a podcast, but by God, I'll put it on the maybe list. Uh, hello, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um, as a talking about the whippoorwills. I do a, I'm Dave Hackett, I live south of Gaze Mills. I do a frog and toad survey uh, every year on 10 sites starting at Gaze Mills and south for several miles. And I consistently at my 10 sites, uh, at least five or six of them continue to have whippoorwills. As a matter of fact, as part of a joke, when I send in my report, I say, the whippoorwills were so loud, it might have been hard to hear all of the frogs. Wow, that's really good news, Dave. Um, and Dave and Alan both, Alan both have a conservation easement on their property. Um, so thank you for that information and for what you're doing with those surveys. And, and Dave, that is good news. And I would be interested in connecting with you at some point in the not too distant future to understand where that is. If we can identify sites that still hold whippoorwills, that, you know, those are then targets for conservation action as it relates to private landowners. There are things that can be done to try to improve conditions for the bird. So it will be good to know where that is. Sure. I have a question. Go ahead, Bob. 
Yeah, first I'd like to, I guess I've never, have I never actually thanked all of the founders of the MVC. I'm not quite a founder. I've been around for a long time, but haven't, I'm, I can't claim that I've been a founder. So thank you all of you that are on. I know most of you. Thanks a lot for starting the organization. Uh, then I've got a question on birds also. Uh, when I first moved here back in 1970, I lived out at what was called the Arrowhead Apartments out by the county old people's home in Pamel Creek area by the train company office. And there were a lot of uh, nighthawks at the time. Now, nighthawks are the same family as the, as the whippoorwill. Uh, does the same thing hold about nighthawks? They seem to have gone away too. Yeah, Bob, it's a it's another great observation by you. And yes, nighthawks are in the same family, the same group behaviorally as the rest of the long distance migrants. They, in fact, winter in the same landscape along with yellow the Gran Chaca, where our yellow-billed cuckoos and a number of other North American migrants winter. There's also another factor with those birds, since they feed on the wing, they're called in aerial insectivores, they're like swallows and swifts. So they're aloft and flying as they're trying to eat insects. And of course, we're grappling in the conservation community with widespread decline in insect diversity and abundance. And we think that's having an impact, just the lack of food is having an impact on nighthawks, swallows, swifts, and so on. And so once again, we've got multiple factors that are conspiring at both ends, both across the hemispheric ranges for these species. And it's proving to be very vexing to try to get a handle on it. But we think that's, those are some considerations as it relates to the profound decline in nighthawks. There used to be nighthawks all over the city of La Crosse when we got here. They were a regular feature and you could hear them calling every night. Now it's, it's a pretty big deal if you hear one. They have literally disappeared from the urban area. So once again, if you have locations where you regularly find nighthawks, I would be interested in knowing about that. We have them in Viroqua. Well, that's that's great to know, Sarah, and I, I will I will follow up with you. I know we go ahead, Todd. I was gonna say quickly. Last year, the local Audubon had a speaker about nighthawks and she was an ornithologist and she definitely said their grassland nesting habitat is greatly reduced because it's farms now. And then her research was on the rooftops of Gunderson and some apartment buildings. But she said the issue there, they get really hot. That, that's not really hot. So it's not just in South America, they have trouble nesting. But maybe that's pretty obvious observation. Uh, the grass don't they nest in the grassland, Craig? Or uh, well, the there, there are species, Todd, that's closely associated with barren's environments in Wisconsin. So you have yeah. scattered pines and sandy substrates, and they like to nest on the ground in those areas and absent those areas. And there aren't a lot of bear, uh, there aren't a lot of high quality barrens left across yeah. Wisconsin any longer. Absent those environments, they've moved into urban areas, and the very problem you identified is, in fact, significant. But there are other things going on that are also impacting the species oh, yeah. as a whole. Yeah, yeah, good. Or bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm open to oh, there. Oh, go ahead, Pat. Oh, hi. Um, I just had a question of uh, Nicole from Organic Valley. I was interested planting trees in the pasture land, what kind of trees and how does that provide feed for the cattle? You said at the end that it could be uh, more feed. Yes, um, so the species that I see our farmers are planting in Pennsylvania are um, locusts, honey locusts and black locusts because they make those locust pods. And so there's some, some research that says that that could provide additional feed for the cattle. Um, and it may actually, because I believe it's high tannins might have a, an effect on enteric emissions as well, like a beneficial effect. 
might be concerned about black locusts. We spend a lot of time trying to eradicate it. I know, right, because it becomes <laughs> almost like a weedy species. Yep. Yeah, and I think, right, the recommended tree species are going to end up varying a little bit by region. Um, that's what seems to be popular in, in the East. Um, yeah, so interested to see what becomes popular in, in the Midwest. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Elizabeth is still here with the Nature Conservancy as well. So if you have any questions for her. Not a question, but a congratulations. I guess it's a question. So Elizabeth, I saw recently that TNC just protected a very large tract of land in central Wisconsin, and which is huge. Congratulations on that. Can you provide additional perspective? Well, thanks, Craig. Um, appreciate it. That is a similar, we, um, one reason that we felt like, wow, we don't know if we can do the Plum Creek project was because we also knew this one was in the work. So a lot of good things were coming together at the same time and our hands were full. Fortunately, in that instance also, so this is 3,200 acres in the central sand um, part of Wisconsin. So just a little bit east of the driftless, but also has those pine barren, that pine barren habitat that Craig was talking about. Um, it's habitat for um, Kirtland's warbler uh, in those jack pines and sand barrens and um, the regal Nope, not the, the Carnar Blue butterfly, because there's a lot of opportunity for lupin in that part of the state. So we purchased several different tracks. One is adjacent to Quincy Bluff, which is a nature, nature conservancy started that project, I think in the 90s. It's about 3,700 acres. That's the preserve that's open to the public. The DNR now owns and manages Quincy Bluff. And the largest tract out of these 3,200 acres that we purchased is adjacent to Quincy Bluff. And it's another, that prop, the, the, the combined 3,200 acres are also important in that resilient and connected network in that, um, that we talked about that the Plum Creek property is also a part of the, just parts of Wisconsin that really rate for biodiversity and for climate corridors for wildlife. And then also for climate resilience as our, you know, as the climate does change and habitat needs to move around a little bit. I don't know if you had any other specific questions, but thanks for noticing, Craig. We've definitely been had a lot to celebrate this year. Oh, while I'm on, while I'm off mute, I have a question for the group. You know, I knew about this, of course, I knew about our surprise announcement. But even before Abby got to that, I was already clapping out, literally clapping. I'm here alone in my home um, at all the other successes that you all are celebrating this year. And I was curious, is there, you know, do you have a favorite in, in everything the MVC has done? You know, what other, would you, you know, you can't have a favorite child, but is there a place that you'd recommend that a newbie like me would visit when we get out there? You know, we probably all have different opinions, um, but I know many people really love uh, Tunnelville Eclipse uh, Nature Preserve. If you, if you haven't been to that one. Um, okay. Did you say Tunnelville? Tunnelville. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, Elizabeth, if you go onto our website, all of our nature preserves are listed there, along with the information, the history of how the properties were acquired and trail maps, um, brochure of what you might see when you're on the property. So I encourage you to take a look. Thanks, I will. Another favorite is Sugar Creek Bluff right along the Mississippi River. And that one uh, is one of the first properties we ever acquired was on Sugar Creek Bluff and it was something like 60 acres. And now it's something like 400 acres. It's really grown and it's really beautiful. Okay. Good. One piece at a time. Well, I, I did not know that Gretchen Benjamin was one of the founders. And as probably many of you know, she works for the Nature Conservancy or, um, and I, so I met her through all of her work on the Mississippi River. Um, you had a slide from that Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, she's 
um, restoration area. She made such a difference there. But and I had no idea about her role with you. Very cool. Yes, we're so fortunate. The visionaries that we had that started the whole thing more than 25 years ago because they spent a couple of years just getting it all figured out. <laughs> Well, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I can let you all get on with your day. Uh, this has been really fun and thank you again. Uh, it takes a team and you're all a part of that team. Um, you know, from our landowners to our volunteers, to those who, who had the vision to start with and those who continue to work on it today. Uh, so thank you. We have a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline this year in our 25th anniversary. So just stay tuned, there's more to come. This is just the kickoff today. Uh, and if, at any time you have questions, concerns, need information, um, visit our website, give us an email, give me a call, whatever you need to do to find out the information that you need, we are here for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. MVC owes us all a cup of coffee and a donut, though, you know. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Next no year. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you.